Hello, and welcome to the Practical Leadership Podcast, where leaders share their tools and practical advice to make you a better leader today. I'm your host, Max Kozlowski, and today we have a very special guest. Before I tell you who he is, even though you might be able to see him right now, this, this person is what you call a leader of leaders. He's an advocate. He's a voice. He's a voice for small business. He is a, what I call a connector, a communicator, someone that's always looking for opportunities to add value, to get people together, to develop further understanding and to further opportunities for business development, business growth, and the well-being of the community as a whole. Ever since I've met him, I've seen is he's a giver. He listens. He's always willing to help. He's always willing to support. He is the current president and CEO of the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce for the whole United States. Ladies and gentlemen, Ramiro Cavazos. Ramiro, it's so awesome to have you here today. Well, thank you. Thank you, Max. I uh, appreciate your kind words and, and your, your beautiful thoughts. I uh, am honored to be here with you. I have so much respect for the work that you do. It is so important that all of us as human beings realize that each of us can be a leader by just doing the things that, that we need to do to support one another. And so, um, thank you for this opportunity for have a, a conversation and it's an honor to work for the United States Hispanic chamber of commerce and, and uh, help, uh, strengthen our Latino community nationwide, especially our business community. Thank you. So in practical leadership and practical leadership, right? We we're going to bring it down and we're going to tap into Ramiro's career of leading organizations, of leading people, of leading the development and in building of those relationships. And, and our audience is going to be lead, take, taking away some, some very specific things they can do to get better and great outcomes for them, for themselves and their teams right away. Before we get started, Ramiro, well, just kind of let us, let us know a little bit about what's been going on in your world. What is something really good that's happened over the last few months or so? Well, I think that what I'm seeing the last few months, uh, clearly we've all gone through uh, this horrific pandemic uh, and so many other uh, aspects of our lives that have been challenges. Uh, I, I believe that uh, there's optimism. Uh, our business community uh, is very resilient because when you get into business, you're a risk taker to begin with. And, and, and no one's going to give you anything. You have to earn everything, have to earn your customers, have to earn your income, have to earn your reputation. And, and so small business owners are creators. They're dynamic people that inherently uh, are a special breed and Hispanic Americans have a higher percentage of entrepreneurship than non-Hispanics, uh, including Anglos, African-Americans, Asians. We do this almost instinctively. And so it, that, that is what I'm seeing is that there is optimism about the economic future of our nation in spite of all of the challenges we've seen. Our community uh, is, is ready to continue to adjust and be successful to create that livelihood we want for our families and to keep the largest economy in the world booming. And, and that's already been proven out. Thank, thank you for, for those thoughts. So the good news is, right, there's optimism and there's progress, there's momentum. So what, what do you think it, 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 it's about, like what's in the DNA of, of the Hispanic community that makes them resilient, entrepreneurial and optimistic? Well, I, I, you know, the, the thing about being Hispanic is, uh, that we're an ethnic group. Uh, we're blonde haired, blue eyed, Max, like you, we're Caucasian Latinos, depending on our DNA. We're also, uh, African Latinos or Afro Latinos. If you're Brazilian, Puerto Rican or Cuban or other, uh, ethnic groups within our Latino uh, population. And then we're also Asian Latinos, if you're Filipino uh, or half Korean, half Hispanic. And so we're a, a beautiful, we're Native American, clearly a lot of 
uh, Indian uh, native blood in the Americas after the Spanish came here. So, but this community, um, the culture, what's in our culture is a community of sharing, a community that believes in family, risk-taking. I mentioned that earlier. Why would someone leave their country and go halfway around the world to, uh, you know, colonize something that they didn't even know would even be there? But that's the story of our community for more than 500 years. We colonized the Americas. Uh, and quite frankly, anyone that says today, well, you know, the Spanish were blah, blah, blah. Their last name is Sanchez. And the same people complaining are the same people that uh, owe their, their DNA and their resilience and probably their economic strength and their education to this beautiful culture of Latino that is now the majority of the Americas and the second most popular language or utilized language in the world uh, after Mandarin, from what I understand, in English. And so I, I feel that that uh, there's this gentleman named Joaquin Playa. I think he is in his 80s. He used to run Univision and Telemundo in the 80s and 90s and Cuban-American immigrant, Joaquin said something that's always stayed with me that, and his phrase is, being Hispanic is a state of mind. And so when somebody comes up to you, well, you don't look Hispanic, or you don't act Hispanic, or you're not like his. What is Hispanic? It's whatever we want it to be. And this dynamic, beautiful culture is entrepreneurial, it's a young community. Our average age in the U.S. is 30 for Latinos, but the average age of Americans in general, all groups, is 50. So by 2040, 2040, the 62 million Latinos will be 100 million in the U.S. of a population of 400 million that today is 320 million. That's going to grow by 80 million in the next uh, 18 years. But half of that growth, 50% plus, will be Hispanic American. So uh, this is not corporate social responsibility anymore to listen to your podcast or to uh, maybe support one of our businesses or make investments in our community. It is an economic necessity. So it, in my estimation, what drives us is success. What drives us is uh, being... Uh, is having solidarity as a community uh, and, and honesty. We're a very honest community. Uh, nobody's more honest than your mother, Max, or your family to us, uh, but it keeps us honest. So we're a very honest community, hardworking, and also um, we're our own toughest critics. I mean, the biggest challenge we have, Max, is that when somebody bids on a contract that's one of our members and they don't get it, they're harder on themselves and may not come back. So part of our job is to say, don't give up, come back, learn from your mistakes. And uh, that's part of the American dream is that failure is how you learn to become successful. And in our community, uh, you know, we're, we're just so hard on ourselves, not to mention others being harder on us. Yep, yep. So that's where the resiliency comes in. That's where our strength comes in. And so that's why I think we're so optimistic. Sorry for such a long end. Oh, that's excellent. I, I, I just wanted to add a little piece, which is my personal experience, which is uh, when, I, when, I, when I moved here, um, 2008, 2009, we're going through a recession. Um, I heard a lot of stories and in, in a certain way, people were out of sorts, freaking out a little bit. And I'm like, it's not such a big deal, guys. I've gone through several of these in my lifetime, right? Right now we're dealing with inflation and people are like, oh my God, what are we going to do with inflation? I'm like, 80s? Have you guys heard about the 80s, right? <laughs> um, or Mexico? So, so it, it's kind of like we've, we've been through, through some of these troubles before. Right. We've experienced them. We've, 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 we've had to grow for them, right? We, we, um, there's a lot of sayings, right? Um, but, but, you know, if, if, if there's a place for four people to eat, there's a place for five people to eat. 
right? And if you need to make it to six, you just add a little bit more water to the soup. Right. Um, but but we have that that solidarity. We've gone, we've been through a lot. We've gone through a lot, and uh, I I think that that's kind of what hardens hardens the spirit a little bit and, and allows us to push forward. That's I, just I love I love what you just said. Is that we we are uh, accommodating and welcoming and hospitable as a community, and that's why you know we are so resilient. Is that we. We, we roll with the punches, as they say here in the U.S. Yep, yep. So, Ramiro, on the subject of leadership, when, when did you first become aware, know, or understand that there was such a thing as leadership? Well, I, you know, it's a, it's a hard question for me to answer because uh, although I was born in the U.S. and not in a technically an immigrant, uh, you know, my family had been in South Texas for many, many years. And when um, the year I was born, 1961, so I, I'm dating myself here, that same year, my father became an elected official in South Texas, a justice of the peace. They basically married people, you know, in the backyard of our house, or there were minor misdemeanors, according to Texas law, judges or justices of the peace were you know, kind of at the, at the grassroots level. And so I would see people show up at my house. They wouldn't even have an appointment. I mean, they would honk the, their horn. My mother, who was not from deep South Texas, she was from a, a shrimping village called Palacios on the Texas coast. So on my mother's side, the Flores were the kinder, gentler camaroneros. They were also entrepreneurs. You know, they were shrimpers. Uh, and then on my father's side, they were the rough, you know, uh, South Texans who settled when the Spanish land grants came 300 years ago and never moved, but they settled in kind of the desert South and, and West of Northern Mexico and South Texas. And in many instances, it was at that time controlled by native, uh, native Americans, you know, and so it was not the place to be to succeed in life. And, uh, so, uh, you know, for me, I learned about leadership I, by the example set by my, my father and my mother, where when people came to the house and they needed help or their son got in trouble or their daughter needed assistance for whatever reason, they would show up at my dad's house and say, nos puedes ayudar, uh, uh, pues. And, and for me, I saw that they would just show up. And of course, my mother, after a few years, Max was like, what do they think we are? A, a restaurant where you, it's curb service? You know, of course, today it's a, a drive up, right? Because of COVID. But in those days when people needed help, there was no email. Phones were, there were no cell phones. It was just the landline. And so it was, it was not as easy to get a hold of people. So cuando alguien necesitaba algo, when they needed something, they would just show up at the house. And so I, I saw my father really being of service, but it really wasn't because of his job. So I saw him give of himself. And so I think in my own mind, in my own upbringing, I was the oldest of four kids. We saw that public service side. And so I never... To this day, I don't consider myself a leader, Max. A leader doesn't think they are a leader. In my opinion, a leader uh, is something or someone that someone else says that's a leader, but one can't say that about themselves, in my opinion, uh, and uh, stand on their own two feet because the way I see it, you're doing service, you're supporting one another, you're helping, and you're doing what you're supposed to do as a human being is to share and to uh, learn and to listen. You said something earlier uh, that, that I really work hard is uh, I try to listen and learn from others and figure out what the best plan is with data. So make a long story short, a leader for me is one that listens, uh, understands, uh, brings people together and come up with solutions that make sense for the greater good. 
but it's also selfless. It's not somebody that says, follow me because I'm a leader, but it's somebody that says, this is what I think we should do. What do you think? And you seek that, that, uh, support. And I think those are the real leaders, our authentic grassroots listeners who don't think they're leaders, but quietly are empowered and people pay attention to. And so it's not a label. It's more of a, again, a state of mind. So, so for those of you that don't know Ramiro or haven't had a chance to work with him or interact with him, um, I can tell you, I was, I was part of a couple of committees, uh, when you were the president and CEO of the Hispanic chamber of San Antonio. And I remember you being in the room, but it was almost like you weren't in the room. Um, you kind of kicked things off, got things on track, but, but the conversations were, were, were happening and you kind of were a, a, a listener of that. But at the same time that you knew that, that there was someone you know, moving the machine forward. Um, and I, of course I've interacted with, with, with who you had as a team there as well. And you know, that they were very well led as well and, uh, have grown and developed themselves into, 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 into higher, better positions, different opportunities as well, which is a great reflection of, of, of a lot of your teachings. Thank you. So, um, how, how did you develop that approach? Right? Like, how did you develop that approach of, Hey, let me, let me build teams. Let me work through others. Let me get other people to interact. Well, I, 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 I believe that, uh, teaching and, and, uh, helping develop, uh, talent and acquiring talent with raw skills is what good leaders do. And thank you for the, the, the example, because I think that you do have to set the example if you want to have people uh, go in the right direction. And if that's leadership, then uh, that's leadership, but you're, you cannot, you know, there's a saying that says, uh, eagles don't flock well together. <laughs> and, and that, that is true because those are eagles are leaders typically as described as leading a pack, but it, it's hard for folks who think they're a leader to listen to one another. And so the best leaders I believe, uh, are people that convene the talent, uh, in, in the room, uh, and learn from each other to come up with solutions that the majority of us can follow. And so that's really today. It's somewhat polarized Max in our society. You have people. You know, of course we're a two party system, but you have people shouting at each other today or people that say, you're not listening to me, but then that same person's not listening to the other side. And I believe that lack of relationship is, is broken right now. And so we are struggling with leadership in this nation because we think leaders are the folks that are the loudest in the room when in fact. The best leaders are the thoughtful conveners, uh, and bring others together. Uh, there's another saying that, that I really believe in. If, if you're, if you're the, you're, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Yep. And, and, and I don't say that to be humble and the example you gave of, you know, yes, our job is to kind of kick it off, invite the right group. But then you all, you all, meaning you, Max and others, you all come up with those solutions. And if, if there's something to add, to kind of guide people, uh, you know, uh, that's where really we come in to keep us on track, but to provide a, a, a space that's fair, a fair broker. You've heard that term before. I, you know, we, we need more fair brokers today in this world. And we're really struggling and, and, and all the things you mentioned of the things we've experienced, the eighties, uh, you know, uh, the great recession, you know, nine 11, the, in the seventies, I'm a, a little bit older than most people, the energy crisis, uh, of the seventies, uh, and not to mention the peso devaluation, right? So I could go on and on. So for me, uh, it's really, uh to developing talent and, and, but people that also are good listeners 
Max, because I think that we, that is in short supply today. You, you mentioned something I want to go back to, because I think it's so powerful. Um, and th it's the idea that we, we have to model behavior. And, and part of the problem is that our role models are not necessarily, um, showcasing the skills because here's the thing, right? If you're not screaming, then you don't get the attention, right? And therefore it's the people that speak the loudest that get the attention that become the role models. And I see that on the business side as well. So there's, there's people that, uh, you could argue that they're good leaders or have been great leaders, right? The Steve jobs comes to mind and, mm -hmm. and you, and, and people think that that's who I have to be. Right. I actually, I actually talked to, uh, uh, to the CEO of a company. He might actually be listening. Uh, and he said, I have to be like Steve jobs for my company, which is crazy. Right. right. Um, first of all, I wouldn't want anyone to have that, that type of life Two, who said that that's the best way to lead a company or to grow a company. Right. Uh, we could talk about a bunch of other great, better examples of leadership that have accomplished great things and had a happy, fulfilling life as well. Right. So it's like, what is our role model of success? And, and we've got to make sure that we've, we set the right ones. And I, it sounds uh, to me like you, you had part of your role models in, in this case, your father and mother, they were about serving and they were about helping and you kind of learned, you kind of learned that part. So for those leaders that feel that they have to have all the answers, they have to have the best point of view or the best opinion. Were you ever, were you ever like that? And did you transition into the more mature, let me listen, let me work with the teams or were you always more like that? That's a great question. I mean, I, I think when you're younger, Max, I, I in my twenties, um, I, I, you know, of course I mentioned my father and mother, I, I had the ability to go to college at the university of Texas at, at Austin. And of course it was a very small community of Latinos at that time. And the numbers have gotten better from a diversity standpoint, but, um, you know, you, you go to the big city, if you will. And then I ended up going to graduate school in San Antonio. That's how I ended up uh, going to St. Mary's university to study economics, business, and political science. And was basically trained to be a, a city manager with budgeting skills. So these people that I worked for, uh, Senator Lloyd Benson, I worked part-time for, for him in Austin, representative Irma Rangel from Kingsville, the first Latina state representative, they were great mentors for me because although they were in these positions of leadership, right, their approach was very ecumenical, very engaging. Both of them were multilingual. Also, both of them grew up in South Texas. So in many ways I was spoiled with my early mentors that I had people that understood where I grew up. A lot of folks, when they think about us from the border, they think that we're, uh, you know, maybe not as erudite or as cultivated as others in, in this country. At the end of the day, when you look at who our leaders are today in key positions, they're people that had, uh, in many ways, there are two kinds of leaders. You have the folks who, um, put the right plan in place, put the right talent in place, and then they move forward. That's one set of leaders. They're, they're kind of the quiet strength leaders. And then you have another set of leaders. They're the, uh, Jack Welch's of the world, the. Steve Jobs of the world, uh, and then today the, the you know uh, the Elon Musk's of the world that are kind of, uh, if you will, uh, lightning rods, right? They're the the kind of, of big big uh, flash in the pan, and they're both good leaders. The ones that are consistent, that put a foundation in place to last are usually the quiet, resilient, patient, talent acquisition folks who may not get all the attention, but they build something that's multi-generational, Max. 
And so for me, early on, yes, I, in fact, I was, uh, somebody showed me an article the other day uh, when I was 25 and I ran the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce in San Antonio the first time I was there. And I was a little full of myself, to be very frank with you. And I remember somebody gave me an article that they found on the internet. You can find anything today, back <laughs> as you know. And, and the, there was this article about the young, you know, CEO of the uh, Hispanic Chamber and how he was taking the city by storm. And his name was Ramiro Cavazos. And uh, one of the quotes in the article was, I'm, and it was quoting me, I'm the most progressive person that I know. Oh my. I read that 30 years later and I'm like, who is that person? And I, it's just being transparent. It was on, that's how full you are at a young age when success comes easier to you. And, you know, it wasn't until I was maybe 28, 29 that I had my first big failure. I ran for city council at the request of some friends, but I jumped in late while I did very well and got into a runoff and why I ran for a job that paid $20 a week at the time, I'll have no idea, but you make decisions sometimes that are not well thought out when you're younger and you say things that you don't think, but you're, you're learning from your mistakes. And so you get devastated more easily when success happens consistently, but you need, that's why I said earlier, failure has been one of the linchpins of my learning to be a more thoughtful leader. I wouldn't consider myself a quiet leader. I would consider myself maybe a, a thoughtful, you know, listener and convener of others to come up with great solutions. Uh, but the thing that, that, so to answer your question, yes, I, I suffered through that. Um, uh, and it took, uh, humbling the hard way to, uh, have me rethink my approach, even though I grew up in an environment with my parents that was about public service. I think when, when you have a father, that's an elected official in South Texas, somewhat, if you're not careful, you feel you might be anointed because of your family name. But one thing my dad said before he passed away is I'm not going to leave you much, but I leave you one thing and it's the last name Cavazos and you need to honor that and respect that and respect is earned. And that's one thing that, you know, I was already in my thirties and forties when my father passed away and, but he, he said, te dejo mi nombre, el nombre que yo también lo recibí, but you have to earn that, that name, you know, and the value of that name. So, uh, I've had some good humbling experiences, Max, bottom line, that would be a whole other podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so do you think that that experience, uh, kind of changed your mindset? <clears throat> You've mentioned this a couple of times now where it's, it's kind of, you know, in, in other words, the legacy, it's a multi-generational it's knowing that the work that you do here is not just for the time while you're here. It's about what happens when you're not here anymore, whether it be. Uh, the success that the Hispanic Chamber of San Antonio continue to have even in, in your absence because of what you left or the name that your father left, did, right. did that kind of flip a switch and say, Hey, wait a minute, I've got, I've got to think about not just the short term, but what I leave behind. Well, it, I think as you get older, it, it, you realize uh, time is short and when you're young, you, you really feel invincible. You think you're going to live forever. And, and I, I think that, uh, again, um, that's why that's where the word wisdom came from. Uh, and, and, and it's, it's because you, you've learned through, uh, really just, uh, a lot of hard work. But for me, I, to answer your, your question, I, I, we, uh, I, uh, I think the Romans had this great saying, I just saw the movie, the Batman, excuse me for bringing that up. Uh, uh we have a lot of, fans I don't know, that. A, what's that? I am sure we have a lot of fans of the movie. Well, I have not watched you it. Know, myself, I but... grew up in the sixties watching Batman. So I went with my boys, the 13 and 16, but one of the great sayings in there was, uh, from, um, uh, 
you know, uh, the Romans. And it was that uh, enjoy life uh, because it's later than you think. And they would put that on their uh, sun uh, dials uh, centuries ago. And it was really so true because, of course, longevity was less because of medical and health uh, care. Today, people are living longer. There's better health care. But so for me, I think I've realized that our, our legacy, our history, uh, our future, your future, Max, and my future is through our children and, and through our family because then they have to continue forward. And that's really what we do here is the time we're here, let's make the best of it. But we also know we're handing it off to our, uh, our legacy. And that's the only future we have, whether we live 30 years or 60 years or 90 years or, or whatever, we don't know when that may happen. And so the time we do have, we need to make the best of it. And, uh, and, and that's where I, I believe my, my, uh, approach to life has been to, to build a strong foundation of work for others. And my name may not be on it, right? I mean, you know, uh, but uh, there's no building named after me and, and I don't want one. Some people get to have that. And usually those are the prominent, noisy leaders. Oh, we better name a building after him or else he'll be very upset. You know, like they're gonna know in the future if that's even possible. But, but I think the legacy building leaders are the ones that, that do things quietly and do it as a part of a team. And, and I prefer that model of leadership because I think it's, it's more enriching. It, it's more respectful also of others. And, and for me, that's what I brought to the U S Hispanic chamber is a better personality as a national association that we're accessible that the, the we're, we have, a, uh, we're approachable, but that we also are intentional and it's not about ego. Uh, it's not about being on MSNBC, you know, although we can do that. It's about how do we create wealth in our community? So we reduce poverty and we improve our quality of life for whatever reason, Max, that is the nature of my approach to work is that that's what inspires me every day is to wake up and, and make all Latinos better and non-Latinos because everything has indirect, we're all interconnected, uh, as we've learned through COVID. So we're, we can't work by ourselves anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Ramiro. I think that, 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 that ex explains a lot about your philosophy, your mindset, your approach. Let me ask you a little bit about the, the how to's, right? Um, is there either a mental process or is there a tool, a template, a format, an approach to leadership? So for example, you gave us something where you said, look, uh, you know, let's, we create a plan and then we put in the right people to execute that plan. Tell me about, do you have a go-to tool or approach that's like, look, there's lots of things that I do, but here's this thing that I want to really share with the audience. One of our goals, uh, during the podcast, and I'll just remind our audience, uh, www.practicalleadership.com, um, practicalleadership.com with one L, Practica Leadership. And you're going to be able to download a summary of today's podcast, and you're going to be able to download a tool uh, or a process that we're going to be discussing on how you could implement a little bit of what is in Ramiro's mind. So with that said, is there a go-to approach that you could share with our audience a little bit? Yes. Uh, I am a creature of habit, uh, Max. Uh, I, uh, whether it was intentional or not, I, every Monday morning, uh, like most groups, I, I bring our team together and we go over, uh, the week ahead not just what meetings are happening, but how we can collaborate together. And we also do a, a 30 day and, and a six month kind of uh, quick advance review. And we're always thinking ahead. And, and, uh, and then we also have uh, 
I'm a big believer in to-do lists. I mean, it, it is, gives me great satisfaction at the end of the day, if I have my list of 20 things that I need to accomplish that day, because we need to be action oriented also. There are too many people today, in my opinion, that are theoretical uh, or speculate too much about what we need to do. I believe you need to write things down to see them and then make sure that that dream becomes a reality. And you do that with people and you do it with tools that are very basic for me. I, I, I know I've had every uh, tool imaginable shared with me, uh, you know, a, uh, uh, you know, a calendar book with that, you know, is fancy and it costs 500 bucks. I've done that, uh, uh, applications that you download to help you do this, do that. And I, I need to tell you, you, you try to kind of find new ways to become a leader or to learn how to be successful at the end of the day, it's about people and it's about working with teams and it's about trusting each other and that's how we are successful in in, in my my belief uh, uh i love to tell our staff you know uh, we're in the people business and i say that too much and they get tired of it and we're also in the yes business and so they literally younger people go does that mean i can't say no i said no you can say no but you need to find solutions. You can't just shut the door down and, and, and close uh, opportunities. And so for me, it's, we're in the people business. We, we a positive energy drives success, in my opinion, action items that you check off. The last thing I would say that drives my success is you got to show up. Uh, I, you know, maybe he's not the most popular person to quote, but Woody Allen, I think has a saying that I've read where 70% of success is just showing up. And how many times have you met people, Max, or talked to folks and they go, well, Max, you didn't invite me. Well, you invite them and then they don't show up. And so it's really showing up and, and contributing uh, that, because uh, then people rely on you. You're consistently regarded and respected and so every Monday morning when we meet, uh, we have our checkoff list of items where it's a team approach, no silos. I hate silos. People that say, well, I sent the email out too. No, you got to follow up also. I, I think you got to always double check what you're doing. So lists, I believe in teamwork, having a plan that is um, weekly. Uh, quarterly and then uh you know of course looking at the rest of the year uh you always have to be thinking ahead uh and uh my last point i will leave you with is i remember i went on a trip to japan and i had a five-year strategic plan for economic development for the city of san antonio we were trying to recruit uh toyota to town they're here luckily but we had zero automotive manufacturing jobs Max, 20 years ago, but we, we had a vision and we put their pieces in place, even though we were not an automotive city and we were maybe not the, the best candidate, but they trust, we, we built trust with them because when they came to visit and other cities, we had done our homework. So do your homework. We had green tea for them. Other cities in America that were competing against us with automotive manufacturing jobs with more resources, had coffee for them. Mm. It made a big difference. So understand your customer, understand where you're going, be thoughtful, do your homework. So I remember handing my five-year strategic plan to one of the Toyota executives at a meeting. And he says, oh, that's very impressive, Ramiro. And he goes, uh, let me give you our strategic plan. And he gave me the Toyota plan. This is 20 years ago. And it was a 50 year plan. Wow. And I was blown away by the fact that Toyota, the reason it's so successful in a top 10 global company is they think it and plan in 50 year increments. So again, it gets back to leadership. Is it about one individual 
and how dynamic they are or how loud they are? Or is it about a team approach that is methodical, plotting, checking off boxes and bringing teams together? And that's why they, their automation has been so successful in their planning. So for me, those were lessons learned uh, in my 30s and 20s and, and later on in my 40s that have really reinforced that leadership is, is a team approach. Thank, thank you so much for that. That's super insightful. There's two subjects I, wanna, I would like to dive a little bit deeper in. One is very technical, but yet uh, so important. And, and the other one is something that continues to show up with, with, with leaders in our podcast, which is the subject of trust. I'm going to start with, uh, with the meeting. So you, you, you pointed out the importance of team meetings that get everybody aligned on the same page, uh, enable great communication and everybody has clear expectations, knows what the rest of the team is doing and what needs to get done, right? And uh, in the world of scaling up, nice plug for me here, um, <laughs> we use a tool called who, what, when, which is kind of like a to-do, but it has accountability of, of, of person and time. Um, how, how do you run that meeting? Like, how do you know if the meeting is being successful or if it's being a waste of time? What have you learned about that? How do, how do I run that meeting to make it worthwhile? No, it's, it's a great question. We easily meet for an hour. You shouldn't meet too long, uh, which even an hour may be too long for folks. We have a, a small team of maybe 14 uh, people. We're growing and we're rebuilding a national association that quite frankly had struggled for a while with its own uh, position in the marketplace. And so strategic planning, hard work, uh, building programs and services, acquiring trusted, honest people, good governance, ethics. I have not mentioned, but those are two things that need to be practiced every day because you don't fix those issues overnight. It's not like filling your gasoline tank because like gasoline, you know, that only lasts for some number of miles. And so same with ethics and good governance. You have to live them and breathe them every day, but that builds that trust that you mentioned. And so the meetings, the way we run them, we have an agenda. So send it to everybody in advance, no secrets. There's nothing worse than surprising people uh, when you're trying to define what our, our focus is. And, and then you let people um, by department share what their focus is. And usually at those meetings, I'll do a, just a quick off, you know, uh, and re-engagement at the beginning. How was y'all's weekend? Well, I did this and we spend like five minutes, Max, reencontrándonos. We kind of like, you know, it's, I, I, although it's just been two days since Friday, it's a way of saying, how are you doing? What did you do this weekend? How's your family? And it, it's just us. And, you know, you never know. Uh, some people went on a little fishing trip or whatever, but it, it kind of builds that esprit de corps, that, that kind of like familial thing that this isn't just about the work, it's about the outcomes. And so, so it, that's how I start the meeting. Usually it's just a little kind of personal kind of contribution, allow others to contribute. Then we hit it hard for about a good 50 minutes. And then, it, and we go through department by department, we troubleshoot. There's new business also. So if somebody says, you know, it's not on the agenda, Max, but I've got something that I just found out about. We also do kind of new business. So we troubleshoot things that were not planned because that's life, right? And at How the end, flexibility uh, within the meeting, you need to have that flexibility. And at the end, I always make sure to thank everybody for their work. We don't, we don't thank people enough for what they do. We, once we check off that box, we move on to the next box, but we're human beings. And so today, you know, we're going to have a big annual conference in Washington next week, our legislative summit. And uh, at the end of a, 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 a hour long meeting, it was our last checkoff. I said, I look forward to seeing everybody in DC. When do you get there? There's some people that are already there. But at the end, uh, I said, I just want to thank you all 
for your hard work. And as I was saying it, Max, because I've been working hard too, I, I couldn't finish my words. A little bit like right now, I said, I want to thank you all from the bottom of my heart. And that pause, although it was not intentional, it was heartfelt, literally, it, it made a difference in our staff to say, you know, he didn't just say the words. How many people say, thank you, Max, but they don't mean it. I meant it because that's how we work as a team. And at the end, you know, it was beautiful to see. I know it's our modern way of, of thanking each other. I saw a bunch of hearts on the Zoom by people who also themselves were like choking up slightly because it's, it's an odyssey to put things together and then to deliver them successfully. And so we all have our fingers crossed. So for me, that's how I run our weekly meetings is that you, you, you start off with, with personal connection, you get to the work, you leave uh, open for new ideas. And at the end, you, we should all, a good leader, I think, if I'm a good, is that you need to be grateful for everybody's contribution, because then I believe their contribution becomes stronger and, and more beneficial and becomes more sincere. Because I, I think that's how you build great teams and how with limited resources, you can outcompete others. I, I, I'm a big believer that I may not be the smartest person or the loudest or have the best resources, but we always together can outwork others with, uh, limited resources in their mind. So I'm, I'm okay. If somebody, and maybe that's true in South people, uh, that are like, you know, people sometimes underestimate us, Max, but you know what? I'm okay. If you underestimate me. Uh, the door is going to be even more open for us to outcompete. Yeah. And, and this is a free enterprise system. We are a competitive economic environment and it's okay. So thank, thank you for that. And I, and I do want to take a step back to, to, to recognize that you're, you're saying we've, we've got to make sure that we are, we have time for gratefulness, that we have time to, to look at what is good and what is working. And, and to, to, to become aware of the efforts and the good things that we've done and have, because you wouldn't have felt that way if it wasn't true. And for that to be true, it means that a lot of things had, have had to happen to be able to get there, right? You, you had to have a good plan that you were following and implementing and executing on, including the right people to be able to get to that point but you made sure that there was time for that. So I, I really believe that, uh, in today's world, um, how we make people feel is more important than it ever has been. So oh, true. And, and we've got to be aware of that and our newer generations care about that even more. And, and we've got to learn to adapt to that as well, which is, I believe is just overall a good thing. Um, so the caring and the trust kind of go hand in hand. So I know we're starting to run a little bit short on time, but how do you build trust? Trust is such an important thing, uh, such an important element of any high performing team. What are some of your how to's on, on trust? Well, for me, um, Max, the best way that I've been able to build trust with people is, uh, by being, uh, honest all the time. Uh, uh, it, it is, um, you know, there's nothing magical about leadership. Some people think, you know, that, that it, it's something that can be scripted. I mean, you know, for me, leadership or building trust is, is based on, uh, transparency and clarity and. If people can, if you can meet people where they are and they can meet you where you are, uh, it, uh, speeds up the process of that mutual respect. I always tell people too, you know, there are a lot of people, well, you, you don't respect me. I mean, that's such a big saying, 
today or, you know, you miss respect is, is earned. It's got to be earned. It's not given and it's not granted automatically. It's got to be earned. So trust, respect, honesty, um, hard work is, is earned. And you need to set the example by practicing what you preach. There are too many people today who think they're leaders and there are two kinds of leaders. They're the public face of that person and then the private face of that person. And usually they don't intersect or they intersect, but they're completely opposite, uh, Max. And so uh, I think best leaders today are people who are genuinely good fathers, good husbands, good friends, and take the time to do all the things that they need to do. But that same person um, should also have that same spirit of, of uh, gratefulness with their public face, their, how, what they say in public, how they uh, treat others. And, and uh, in many ways, I think people have used communications, social media, public relations, marketing, advertising tools to create a facade of being a leader or false leadership. And unfortunately, that's why we get into so much trouble today. So for me, I, I know we're running out of time, but for me, you know, there's nothing like not having to worry about what you said or to remember what you told someone because it might not have been true. I don't know how people can function that way because you can't remember everything you might have said that wasn't true. And so for me, it, it's just very simple and clear is that say what you mean and mean what you say, it builds trust and respect, but then it makes you a better person slash leader because people will want to be with you and, and or follow you uh, or build success with you because they genuinely like you as a person. It's not about the paycheck. It's not about the title. It's about how you uh, accomplish things together for one another. And so for me, Max, that's, it, it sounds trite, but that for me, that's the, the best way we've been able to, to have people join us or, or be on our team uh, is, is that they, they believe in you and they want to work with you and they trust you, but that has to be earned. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that. So, you know, a lot, a lot of what you referred to has to do with, with governments, right? And to get the votes, uh, you got to look a right. certain way. You got to feel a certain way. Right. Uh, which is very different than what can happen, what happens in business, in your day-to-day -day life. There, there is no vote that you're getting, or once, if you get the vote and you don't deliver, then, you know, they're not doing business with you again. And it's not a very good way to, to grow a business. But on the government side of things, many times people can get away with that. Heck, it even, it even feels like in today's world, it's almost necessary, which kind of takes us back to the whole idea of, uh, who's your example, right? Which is kind of where we, we started with this conversation where we said, let me to learn about serving others first growing up, uh, through his parents and how they were, they were helping others. And that kind of helped you develop your, 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 your mindset. Um, it, it helped you, um, through the desire and need and want to help others to put yourself in, in positions where you had that opportunity. It, it was very cool to hear how you, how you, uh, grew a lot as an individual through some hardships, um, how you reflect on your past and, and kind of cringe a little bit at it. Um, but, but recognize that your, your whole mindset and approach has significantly changed, you know, starting with the big idea. Uh, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. <laughs> Second, you've, you've got to build the organization through others, which means your number one job as a leader is to build teams. Cause if you can build the teams, uh, and they're, and they're, and they're setting out to accomplish something cross generation, uh, then you're really doing something. So I, I'm just going to touch on that again, because it, 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 you, sure. you, we talked about it in a few different ways. You said, look, Toyota has a, a 50 year plan. We have to have at least a five year, well, a multi-generational plan 
right. five-year plan, quarterly plan, um, monthly plans, and we've got to be able to look further ahead, which means we've got to be able to forecast what's going on and be action-oriented. So you've got the plan, you've got the people, and you're taking action all the time. You like to build habits. You, you like to be action oriented. And you, you said this, you got to show up. You got to show up, you got to deliver so you can build trust. So you can set the example, which will then enable the organization and the people around you to want to do business with you, to, to be able to be transparent, to be able to share. Uh, uh, what's good and what isn't and have the reality in front of you so you could work with that and through that and, 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 and accomplish the outcomes. Um, Ramiro, one of the things that we like to promise our audience is something they can download, right? So we're going to, we're going to give them a summary, but for the audience, I'm going to pick Ramiro's brain and maybe he can give us a sample of his meeting agenda or the structure that he might use for planning something that could be helpful to, to kind of take a little peek at how Ramiro has built these great organizations that continue to succeed, even when he moves on to, 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 to do something else. So practicalleadership.com, practicaleadership.com. That's where you're going to be able to, to find some of this. Ramiro, well, there's, I'm going to close with a couple of questions for you, right? Yes, so the first one is, I'm sure you have like a million things that you'd like to share. What is one more thought that you, you'd like to share for leaders that are out there? The second question is what's something really fun or exciting that's coming up? So, but no, well, thank you. Thank you again for having me. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I will definitely, uh, give you, uh, our, uh, what I, I would love for y'all to, to see and could download is I will share with you, uh, our, uh, year uh in review our strategic kind of work for 2021 we just did kind of in the first quarter uh, uh kind of a, a year in review but uh, very proud of the fact that that it's like a a roadmap of of what we did to help people during the pandemic especially small businesses which is really a big driver of i think uh, our future success is how we're all more interconnected to one another than we ever imagined, Max. So to, to your point about, um, you know, your question, uh, you know, for me, um, uh, what, um, I think leaders should also realize is we need to be dependable and we need to be consistent. Those are two other words that I have not mentioned. But um, that builds trust too. And so that's one thing I wanted to add at the beginning about, you know, leadership and, and what drives, uh, you know, success is that reliability and consistency. And then the last word is persistence. You, you got to keep plugging away, but people need to learn to trust you and know that it's like part of it is just showing up also. The thing that's exciting me that's coming up this year, in my opinion, is uh, April 21st and 22nd, we are branching out and we're doing an energy summit in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where we were founded by five business owners of Hispanic descent in 1979. The only reason they founded in New Mexico was that there was a snowstorm and they were going to found the chamber in Kansas City, but they had to travel to uh new mexico northern mexico and they ended up in santa fe not a bad place to end up right to have the the inaugural uh launching of the u.s hispanic chamber of commerce but this year april 21st 22nd literally we're 43 years later we're going back home we're having an energy summit to talk about the new energy economy and the the uh, continuum of fossil fuel all the way to solar, wind, and hydro energy. And as you know, gasoline prices, the Ukraine war and, and, and Russia's attack, and then just inflation. You mentioned it earlier. Energy is a big part of our jobs in the U.S., 10% of the jobs, but also a big part of our costs, transportation, trade. And so we're having a, a conference that had already been scheduled 
back in November, but for two days, we're going to meet in Santa Fe to talk about the new energy economy, the fact that fossil fuel and, and renewable can coexist successfully, and they're both good. And so it's not either or. So Max, that's what I'm excited about is convening uh, a group uh, of leaders from around the country in New Mexico. We have, we'll send you information. Also, we'd love to have people join us in Santa Fe for two days to dream big about the new energy economy, knowing that we're not leaving the traditional petroleum fossil fuel economy, but knowing that we do need to make that tra transition because of the tremendous climate change that we're also experiencing uh, through the data and research uh, that we need to be aware of. So sorry for, again, two long Thank answers, you. but no, I, we that's appreciate we are. it. And I think we, we can all feed uh, from, from that excitement. So, so thank you so much for that. Uh, so, you know, if I had to summarize everything, you got to lead by example, you got to be reliable, consistent, persistent, um, to build trust, to have better relationships. Um, lots of cool things going on. We've got, we've got the big energy summit coming up a little bit later in April. Um, hopefully we'll get this, uh, podcast out. So people will hear about this before that, and they can check it out. They'll be able to download some content. We'll also put some links so they can see all the great work that, that you're doing on, on their behalf. There's so many people that benefit from your efforts and from what the chamber does that might not even know, um, that once they do become aware, they might want to collaborate. They might want to participate, do their part. And, and, a, and a, I really believe that the organization is in great hands and we're going to continue to hear more and more about it. And it's going to, to continue to be a, 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 an agent of change and, and of benefit for all small businesses. So thank you again, Ramiro, for being thank here you. today. It's been fun. Uh, it's been, it's been enlightening. Uh, thank you, Max. And it's, and I really appreciate it. Thank you for the invite and thank you for the work you're doing to inspire people to, to be thoughtful leaders. Appreciate it. Thank you so much.